presuppositionalists claim that inductive reasoning can only be justified by reference to Christian presuppositions. Bonson asks, What right have we to read the future into the past? The universal uniformity of nature cannot be verified from the experience of the independent thinker in any final sense, since that principle exceeds the bounds of his experience. So the most fundamental premise of all autonomous science, the uniformity of nature, is neither empirically nor rationally justifiable. Bonson contends that David Hume demonstrated that there is no justification for believing that the future will be like the past. To argue that the sun will rise tomorrow because it has risen every other day assumes that there is regularity in nature, but why should this be assumed? One cannot justify this belief by appealing to the past, for that assumes the very thing one is attempting to prove. We could only know that the future will be like the past if we already knew that regularity exists in nature. Thus, to appeal to the past is circular reasoning. As Colin Housen puts it, that inferences of the same type have been successful in the past will not work without circularity, for that evidence is itself merely a record of what has happened in the past, and any conclusion based on it would therefore presuppose the validity of inferences from past to future, the question at issue. The presuppositionalist solution to Hume's problem is to presuppose the reality of the Christian God who reveals that nature exhibits regularity because he upholds it and ensures that it functions in accordance with the laws which he has created. But does Hume's argument really demonstrate what the presuppositionalist claims? Is there no justification for induction apart from presupposing the existence of the Christian God? I am convinced that there is a way to justify induction in a non-circular way and apart from presupposing God. Now we need to be clear from the start that it is somewhat misleading to speak of the problem of induction as if there was only one. There are in fact two distinct problems which we will need to solve in order to justify inductive inferences. First, we need to explain how a method of inference which does not logically entail the truth of the conclusion still renders it genuinely probable and thus justificatory. Second, we need to explain how one can be justified in inferring something about an entire population from a sample. Let's turn to the first problem. When making a deductive argument, it is easy to explain why we should believe the conclusion. Its truth is guaranteed if the premises are true. The situation for inductive arguments seems quite different since induction only renders its conclusions probable. Just how is it that we can be rational in believing an inductive argument's conclusion if that conclusion could turn out to be false? The solution to the problem of induction is found in direct inference or the proportional syllogism, a non-deductive inference form. Direct inferences follow the same structure as traditional deductive syllogisms, however they differ in that the crucial premise is proportionate to the given frequency of some property within a reasonably large sample of a population. Timothy and Lydia McGrew explain, Direct inference is perhaps the simplest and most natural expression of a degree of entailment interpretation of probability. Given that the frequency of some property x in a population g is p, and given that A is a random member of G with respect to possession of X, the probability that A is an X is P. In a traditional deductive syllogism, we reason that all G are X, A is a G, with full assurance that A is an X. In a similar way, the proportional syllogism would reason that M of N, G, are X, A is a G, with assurance M of N that A is an X. The proportional syllogism admits intermediate grades of logical cogency. They constitute a spectrum of inferences moving from statistical information to particular conclusions about members of a class. The conclusion, just as in a deductive syllogism, is always categorical, but the level of confidence varies with the proportion cited in the major premise. Direct inferences, therefore, are as rational as any standard deductive inference. However, because the syllogism is inherently statistical, the conclusion is only probabilistic. The fact that the conclusion is not certain may be bothersome to some, but Donald Williams reminds us, a somewhat indeterminate logical conclusion like ours is just as real and objective, just as absolute, and just as rigorously certifiable as any could be. Yet how are we to justify our belief in the major premise of a direct inference? This can be done through a combination of Bernoulli's theorem and a second direct inference. 
According to Bernoulli's theorem, most large samples differ only a little from the populations from which they are drawn. With this theorem and a second direct inference, we can construct an argument which will rationally extend our knowledge to the unsampled members of a population. Once again, such an inference is only probabilistic. However, since this method does not assume that the unsampled members of a population will be like the sampled members, it avoids circularity while giving us rational justification for extending our knowledge beyond our own experience. Hence, we have a cogent response to Hume's problem of induction. We do not have to presuppose the uniformity of nature. The McGrews conclude, this solution to the problem of induction is of more than academic interest. Prima facie, it is a cogent response to Hume's challenge. Hume himself grants that we have experience of breads nourishing us and of the sun's rising. If we may take our experience to be a sample, then it appears that we possess all the tools necessary to make a rational defense of everyday extrapolations against Humean skepticism.